So we're going to try to uh, talk now about um, a variety of different uh, types of, of uh, tumors, uh, uh, showing the range of, of uh, presentations that we may encounter, and uh, get our ex expert uh, panelists to uh, share their feelings on uh, how things should be managed. Um, this disclosure, I am not a, a, a neurosurgeon, um, so uh, please ex excuse any ignorance that I, that I may display uh, with my presentations. Uh, we have uh, three renowned uh, neurosurgeons uh, who will uh, be serving as panelists. And let's jump right in with uh, case number one. Uh, so this is a 36-year-old male physician uh, whose uh, tumor was found incident incidentally. He is completely asymptomatic, and he's very reluctant to have surgery at this time. Um, what would our panelists recommend? Uh, Omar? But, uh, so uh, my first thoughts are that this is, is probably most likely uh, uh, chordoma rather than the chordosis end of the spectrum. However, I think looking at a CT might be helpful, see if there's a bony stalk or anything else uh, that, 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 that might give that away to, to, to let us think this is more on the, on the benign end of the spectrum. I would tend to, to, to offer surgery for this. I think the, the, the outcome uh, would be very good. I think it would be safe and effective. It, it's, uh, it's not extending um, too far out into the, into the petrous apices. We can get into that retrocarotid um, space nicely via the, uh, the, the midline route. Um, uh, so my recommendation would, would, would be for surgery. Is that, a, is that a post contrast scan there? So there's not much contrast uptake. Um, uh, again, you know, that could be hinting towards this being uh, more on the, on the benign end of the spectrum, but my, my recommendation would be, would be for, for surgery. And I think it would be a safe and effective procedure. Uh, Bowder, any uh, differences of opinion? Uh, no, I do, I agree. I, we would offer surgery and I would try to convince him to do the surgery now and not wait for the growth, you know, because you probably can do like an MRI in half year or a year later and see if there's any growth. Uh, but it's going to be a chordoma, and um, I think the real challenging question now is if you do a radical resection, you feel that you did a really good job, are you going to do radiation or not? Because I have exactly a case like this, he's a little bit younger, and, uh, and we're just kind of, uh, well, let's not jump ahead of the discussion, but that's, that's the question. Um, Paul, any particular uh, uh, challenges with the surgical approach here? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you can see on that T2, um, it, it extends into both Dorello's canal. You know, we talk about this as being a bony malignancy, but they grow, it grows in the interdural space between the periosteal and meningeal layers is where it grows and expands. And that's how, that's where Dorello's canal is as well. Uh, in addition, the tumor is pushing the gland forward. So a classic upper clival tumor. So it would require a uh, pituitary transposition. Um, these cases have somewhere around a five to 10% chance of permanent DI. Uh, as well. So there's, there are definite risks this person has to accept, but I think that I would agree uh, strongly with con trying to convince them that even the risks of surgery are better than the natural history of this tumor. All right. All right. So everyone agrees that surgery is, is the best option and there's no reason to delay. Uh, we know from our own experience and, and the literature that getting a gross total resection is the most important prognostic factor for the management of these patients. Um, but it, it's obvious that uh, everybody had uh, their, their varying definitions of gross total resection. Uh, so let's get to our, our first uh, question. What constitutes a gross total resection? Um, is it A, a gross removal of all visible tumor, you know, just following the pathway of the tumor? Uh, is it a resection of the visible tumor plus stripping of the outer layer of dura? Um, is it um, uh, that plus the drilling of the surrounding bone, even though it does not appear to be eroded by tumor? Um, or is it D, all of those plus resection of the inner layer of dura, uh, even though it may not appear to be invaded uh, by tumor? And so let's give that a few seconds. Um, uh, perhaps uh, our panelists can start by uh, uh, talking about uh, how do you assess tumor margins, especially with the, with the bone? So I'll, I'll say something. So uh, we, we would tend for chordoma to, to where there is interdural spread to, to assume that the inner layer is also involved and we would resect dura, both inner and outer layer, as well as drilling the uninvolved bone. That, that would be our, our standard approach to this. 
Um, with with chondrosarcoma, we, we treat that a little differently. Uh, and if the uh, both layers of the dura seem to be intact and uninvolved, then we won't necessarily resect all of the dura. Um, uh, particularly if, if we know this is a grade one low risk case. Um, uh, in terms of um, the, uh, the, 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 what we would do in radiotherapy is a really interesting kit thing brought up by Valta, and I think you're going to talk about that for us a little bit later. We tend to irradiate all of ours, whether we've got a super total resection or not, um, and, and that's for discussion a, a little bit later. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised by the response here, um, showing that a majority would just take the visible tumor, because um, I think that's one of the problems with, with chordoma surgery is that we aren't aggressive enough. What do the other panelists think? How much should be removed as part of a gross total resection? I think uh, we should try to remove the dura as well. I, I, I totally agree with Paul saying it's growing in, in between those two layers of the dura. And sometimes you can, you can peel it off and there's actually a nice layer kind of very thin layer underneath that might be fine, uh, but often enough it, it went through it. If you have intradural uh, tumor extension, I, there's, no, there's no issue, right? You're gonna make a hole anyway. So let's make the hole larger. Um, the bony margins I think is the, is the difficult thing uh, because sometimes the, it's very difficult to assess what the bone is looking like in the corners and then trying to drill that out, uh, that might be difficult. I think the, the dura, it, which is in front of you, is in a way, it's easier. Ben, I think um, I think the biggest limitation, obviously, is the uh, ability to safely do a lot of this dissection. Um, in in many ways, I think of this as as doing as much of a pliable resection as possible. Um, certainly, inferiorly, um, I think you should never have a patient who recurs uh, below the level of the tumor in the clivus because you can remove the entire frame and mag all the way down to the frame and magnum. This is obviously not talking about creating cervical tumors, but, uh, and uh, the posterior clinoids can be removed as well. Um, where the real issue becomes is in Dorello's canal and the petrous apex. The petrous apex requires either mobilization of the carotid or this contralateral transmaxillary approach, and that's where we tend to have recurrence. So I think if, you're, if you know you're leaving tumor, at least microscopic laterally, then it changes a little bit of your intraop decision making. But I believe very strongly in as radical of a removal of bone and dura as possible, especially in a younger patient like this. So this is a new patient. He has not gone to surgery yet, but that, that is the plan. Uh, case number two, a 15-year-old male who developed a sixth nerve palsy and had a uh, incomplete extradural resection at another institution. In reading the surgeon's note, you know they just followed the tumor and they curated uh, the tumor off of the dura and around the deep uh, bony margin. Uh, the patient did have recovery of the sixth nerve palsy um, and then uh, uh, came to us with uh, uh, radiographic evidence of residual clival tumor deep uh, to the uh, reconstruction and uh, uh, in the uh, uh, epidural plane. Uh, you can see the narrow canal of the bone removal, this patient has a poorly pneumatized sinus. Um, so it's really not clear um, what the extent of uh, bony involvement is. Um, and then you can see on the MR the extent of the tumor um, uh, in these uh, planes. Um, so let me ask the panelists, what do you think about the prior approach? Um, and what would you, how would you handle this, this bone, this poorly pneumatized bone, even though there's not uh, ev gross evidence that it's tumor involved? So, um, I mean, I think this illustrates one of the, the, the problems when, uh, when you get cases referred in with, with a very narrow channel like that. I think you have, to, you have to drill all that bone away. You have to get control of the carotids early on. We use a tranexamic acid infusion, liberal bone wax during that we allow plenty of time. Um, and and you know, we're, we're expecting that it's going to take us a while. Image guidance is helpful. Uh, the Doppler is helpful um, when, when you've got that, that degree of poorly pneumatized uh, sinus. But I, but I think you have to just take your time, drill it, drill it all out, it, it find your carotids as you would normally do so, expand your field, um, and give yourself as much dissecting advantage as you can for when you get, get down to the tumor. Uh, clearly, I agree. But this is when you do the, the resection initially. 
but what do you do now? Do you take the patient in back to the OR to, to start removing this bone while you're not totally certain it is actually uh, involved? Or are you going to wait and see? Most likely, I guess you're going to offer proton radiation anyways. And we know the, the larger the tumor remnant, the worse the patient does. Um, that's quite challenging. It's too bad they didn't send the patient initially. I think that might be a big lesson for the audience, that if you think of a chordoma, you know, start uh, discussing the case with people that have a lot of experience. I, I think that um, we're close enough to the time of the original surgery that you can still achieve a radical resection. Um, in this case, the bone is very hard to tell. It can certainly, especially in younger patients like this, we've occasionally found more than one rest of, of tumor. Uh, and it's very hard to know, are these multiple areas of tumor uh, in someone who's predisposed to it, or is it just pockets of the same tumor? I think if uh, I look at that top T2, there's a little bit of epidural tumor left. And so that alone, I think, justifies the, uh, you know, clivectomy and resection of that dura that, that has not been done yet. Um, and so this case, because of the extent of superior uh, involvement, a required a pituitary transposition into a, in addition to our uh, standard endoscopic transcellular and, and transclival approach, a standard multi-layer reconstruction with use of vascularized tissue, and no complications from the surgery. And this just shows the extent of bone removal uh, post-op, uh, early post-op scan. And you can see in this case, uh, we did put a uh, uh, fat graft in there and here you see the vascularized nasal septal flap over the fat graft. Um, uh, Paul, can you comment on the, uh, the, how, the extent of dural resection in this uh, surgery? Yeah, I mean, since uh, the tumor really involved uh, uh, both layers of dura, and this is a young patient, um, anything that the tumor touched, we resected and tried to even get a margin. Um, this is certainly not proven but something I've learned from my ENT colleagues is, you know, head and neck tumors, when you get negative margins, you can be more confident of your completeness of resection. So I will even take uh, <laughs> margins. I find this important to also uh, to help uh, communicate with your radiation oncologist. So if I have a positive dural margin, for example, at Dorello's Canal on the right side, then the, my radiation oncologist knows then that's at least microscopic residual that should require a boost. So I think that those margins can help us sort of plot out the tumor to some degree. Um, so what now? Uh, you've, you've got a gross total resection with uh, clear dural margins. Um, uh, are you going to observe uh, this patient with serial imaging and, and wait for evidence of recurrence or progression? Um, offer uh, IMRT, um, refer them to a center, you know, maybe far away uh, for proton beam therapy or do very focal uh, radio surgery. What was the uh, the histology in the end? Uh, I mean, it was a, a standard chordoma. I don't have the a molecular profile okay. on the tumor. So I think you know, to 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 some extent, I mean, we, our approach has been with these cases that we we tend to treat uh, with proton beam radiotherapy, whether we've got uh, uh, um, kind of supramaximal resection or not, um, particularly in in younger patients. It's, in some ways, that's at odds with our other skull-based practice where we, we try and avoid uh, radiotherapy, particularly in, in younger people. Um, but I, I think we've just been guided a little bit by, by the outcomes that, that you sometimes see in, in this younger population, particularly if they're the ones that are smart B1 uh, mutated or, or uh, undifferentiated. Um, but uh, Bauta may have something else to say on that. <clears throat> I think um, I would discuss it with the parents uh, a bit more. I have a, a, a similar case. It was a little older. Uh, the parents didn't want radiation, and we are just following it now for seven or eight years, and nothing really happens. Um, so with this close monitoring, I think postponing uh, radiation, even in chordomas, is an option. Clearly, standard of care is to include proton uh, radiation. Is age a factor in your recommendation? It is. Okay. And what, what are the downsides of observation? Uh, if you have a recurrence, um, you, you might find a, a situation that uh, you're not a, a, able to do another surgery. 
Uh, and so then your volume that's being treated with radiation is worse. There's some publications uh, suggesting that the radiation is initially actually better off than uh, uh, if you do it for a recurrence. Uh, and of course, you have the risk of uh, metastasis with the Cordova. But having said that, we have multiple patients with Cordova that have not received radiation and, and we have not observed this. Local recurrences, yes, we do. Uh, Paul, for patients who don't have easy access to proton beam therapy, is IMRT an acceptable alternative? Uh, I think it absolutely is. Uh, I think the most important thing is the dosage of radiation. Um, I think all of us are uh, uh, prone to send our patients for proton beam whenever possible. It has very obvious um, um, physics-based uh, uh, advantages over IMRT. Uh, but the truth is it also depends highly on the practitioner. Um, you have to have an experienced practitioner delivering the radiation just as you have to have an experienced surgeon delivering the surgery. And so I think our proton beam centers have more experience and that also gives them an advantage. Okay, moving on, case three. Uh, another young person, 25 year old female who had a, a prior resection of a chordoma uh, several years ago, uh, but it was all extra dural. This was followed by proton beam radiotherapy. And now she has onset of occipital headaches and, and neck pain. And uh, this is what we have. Uh, you can see that there is um, recurrent tumor or residual tumor, but it's, it's in that difficult area, inferolateral, you know, occipital condyles, so maybe jugular tubercles, uh, ligaments uh, around C1 and C2. Um, so a not uncommon situation we know from uh, um, our own experience that this is the area we always struggled with and was a big part of our learning curve, uh, being able to deal with tumor or, or being able to clear tumor uh, that extends laterally and inferiorly. Um, so for this uh, residual tumor, a recurrent tumor, uh, what is your recommendation for treatment? Do we observe for growth of this residual tumor and just follow it um, to, to see how quickly it's growing? Uh, do we um, uh, go ahead or give additional radiotherapy, whatever that might be, uh, attempt a gross total resection, or uh, try uh, newer therapies, uh, clinical trials, perhaps using uh, drugs targeting brachyuria? Was the patient followed up between surgery, proton radiation, and now? And do we, do we know if the tumor was growing gradually over time? Um, I, we have no interim imaging from that. Okay. Yeah. And were the symptoms, to, uh, uh, could they be related to a form of instability? Um, Paul, what do you think? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, you know, there, I think there was a post-operative scan that probably had this there. Um, the impression is that this is residual and not necessarily recurrence. But as you know, sometimes the post-op scans can be difficult to tell. Um, I, I think that... Um, it is unlikely this patient is unstable, but um, I think they certainly, you can certainly get a lot more uh, musculoskeletal pain after resecting the pliabus in the craniovertebral junction. Uh, but most patients don't require fixation in that setting. Okay, so um, majority have uh, recommended surgery. Um, so uh, what are the challenges of operating in this area of uh, clearing tumor uh, from this area? So um, in this case, you know, we did a, a, an endoscopic approach to the craniovertebral uh, junction. Um, in this case, there was not involvement of the dura. And so you can see we're, we're stripping tumor that involves the outer layer of dura, but preserving the, uh, the inner layer. So we're able to avoid a, a CSF leak in this case. And then of course, uh, targeted the uh, tumor in the occipital condyles. And, and then used uh, the rhinopharyngeal flap for reconstruction. Um, there were uh, no deficits uh, postoperatively, even though our, extend, our excision extended to the hypoglossal canals, there was no injury to the nerves. And um, any comment on, on uh, the challenges that uh, each of you have found in operating in this area? What is the most difficult part about getting a gross total resection? Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I, certainly, I think this is one of the more difficult pieces of surgery to do with an endoscope through the nose. I think the challenge is always around frame and lacerum. 
um, you've got to divide, divide that, that, that tissue so that you can get out far enough laterally and actually have a decent view and mobility around um, in, in those lower areas laterally. Um, uh, but I think once you've done that, once, once, you, once you've found frame and lacerum, you're confident and you've divided across that tissue and you've, you've kind of mobilized the station tube out of the way, uh, then, then you, the corridor sort of opens up a bit. But it's, it's I mean, that's, that's a difficult case, particularly with, with scar tissue from previous surgery um, and, uh, and so on. I think, I think they have a great job. I totally agree. I think some of the cases also the, the compartments in the, in the musculature of the nasopharynx and oropharynx is hard to find and easy to forget to resect. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely the case. I think, think that when, when it's behind those muscular planes, it's really, really easy. If, uh, you have to almost get around it from the outset and, and, and know your margins as you go through the muscle before. Once you get into it in the muscle, it's really difficult to find your way around the out of it. So I think you've got to try and stay on the outside if you can and find the parapharyngeal carotid and, and, and so on. So Paul, what techniques do you use to resect those uh, muscle and tough ligaments? Yeah, I, I agree completely with what um, the other panelists have said. I think what I try to do is get a little bit beyond it. Um, you know, one of the big challenges on this was involvement of the apical ligament um, uh, as well as tectorial membrane. And so to get around that, you actually have to drill a little bit of the ring of C1, a little bit of the tip of the dens. I found in general, if we leave the transverse ligament and the tubercles and the lateral masses of C1 intact, that we don't impact patient's stability. But in this patient, it's very borderline. We resected almost two thirds of one of the condyles. She does have increased pain postoperatively, very hard to, she doesn't show gross instability. So I'm trying to encourage her through that. Um, but this is a very borderline case for causing instability uh, in a young person. But I, I think you have to resect what you think you need to resect to get beyond the tumor and deal with the consequences. All right, we'll finish up with a different type of tumor, our, our, our chondrosarcoma, an elderly woman uh, who had a, a large obstructive nasal mass, had partial resection followed by a gamma knife irradiation elsewhere, and now and has persistent uh, diplopia uh, due to uh, bilateral uh, cranial nerve six palsies, which she corrects with prism lenses, and uh, has an obvious uh, midline mass uh, pushing the middle turbinates laterally normal pituitary function. And uh, this is what we see on, on imaging, uh, CT demonstrating a large expansive mass, you know, going to the skull base. Uh, um, um, and here on MR, you can see quite extensive going back to the, to the cavernous carotids um, up to the skull base. Um, so I guess first off, um, this is not a typical location for a chondrosarcoma. So What's the origin of this tumor? Where do you think this originated? Maybe the, the cartilaginous part of the nasal septum? I mean, that's my experience. Whenever you see a midline chondrosarcoma like this, it's coming from the septum. Um, so not all chondrosarcomas arise, arise in the petroclival area. Um, um, so let's, um, yeah, let me uh, just, uh, you know, sort of a standard, uh, you know, binarial approach, uh, drilling out all the involved bone, taking everything to dura. Um, now, the only area we encountered trouble was around the left internal carotid artery. It wasn't clear if we cleared the tumor from that area. We were able to preserve the meningeal layer of dura, which greatly facilitated reconstruction. Um, and other than some transient DI, um, she just has the persistent uh, diplopia, which she already had, so things aren't worse. Um, so uh, what now? Um, oh, I guess, um, wh what are you looking for in the pathology report? Um, what's important to you um, as far as uh, management of this patient? So you can see that our pathology reports have lots of parts. <laughs> uh, we like to map out the areas of tumor involvement. Uh, for a sinonasal malignancy, we may have 60 specimens. Um, and so this could be helpful in case you have a positive margin that you want to address. Um, or for radiation planning. Um, uh, what else is important to you? So yeah, I think that the margins are very important. The CHI-67 we like to see. Um, we, we, in this location, it's unlikely to be a, a, a chordoma 
Um, but we, you know, we still like to see a, a brachyuri staining just to be sure we've been caught out with some strange things. You know, it's not impossible with previous surgery to have an implantation, although I think it's probably pretty rare. Um, uh, and uh, and then you want you want your, your breakdown as to what 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 it is, what type. And I think we also, in addition to pathology, want to see um, a staging imaging uh, and potentially a bone scan as well, um, particularly with a recurrent tumor. So you can see this is a low-grade chondrosarcoma, grade one of three. And uh, so what now? You have a, a gross total resection, a low-grade tumor. Uh, will you continue to observe with uh, serial uh, MRI scans? Um, go ahead and treat with radiation therapy, specifically proton beam therapy. Or would you give uh, focused radiation just to the uh, area of positivity in the, in the uh, left cavernous sinus? So we, we would not treat um, partially. I think if we were going to treat, we would treat uh, the complete volume rather, rather than partially. Does it impact you, uh, Omar, this patient had radio surgery when this was a much, much smaller tumor? Yeah, I'm sure that's going to affect them. We, we talk with our radiation oncologists, who are, two of them are online now, and I think uh, they'd probably tell us that it would be a real challenge. Certainly in the UK, we wouldn't be able to treat with proton beam if they'd already been irradiated previously. That's, that's not uh, within criteria. Um, uh, but I think the fact that they've had previous treatment, there's been a significant uh, recrudescence of the disease. Um, I think you do have to treat this um, fairly aggressively despite the, despite the low kind of 67 and, uh, and um, low grade. Uh, Bowder, what are you, what's your opinion? Well, I, I didn't realize that the tumor was growing. So you, you, Paul was saying it was initially much smaller when they had radio surgery and then it was growing? Well, no, it was a partial excision. So this patient never had an attempt at complete resection. Right, but, you, but we have proven growth though. I mean, there's been some growth in the interim. For okay. sure. yeah. Because on a great one, I would say if you did a radical resection, I, I will be happy to wait and see what happens. But if we have already proven that it's growing, I think uh, we need to do proton radiation. Well, what do you mean, proven that it's growing? I mean, it's sort of a natural growth of this tumor over, over several years um, um, following incomplete resection. Right. So I, it's not considered more than usual growth. No, I understand. But it's, yeah. but it's, but it's also not a dormant tumor in, in a way. Correct. Yeah. So I, I would, uh, we would offer proton radiation. Uh, Paul, what's our philosophy on, on grading of tumor and, it, and use of radiation? I, th I think grade one and two is the same. I don't think it matters. Uh, grade three uh, is a more aggressive tumor. Um, also, age uh, matters. Uh, inversely, what we might think, younger patients tend to have more indolent tumors, and some of these older patients can have more aggressive tumors, especially in this location. I think given the growth, uh, the fact that it's already been dosed previously, I probably actually would treat it with radiation, if possible, to the entire bed. Uh, you know, part of it is the patient's older, so we want that we get uh, the maximum effect out of radiation by hopefully avoiding other surgery in their short and their shorter lifespan. Uh, not an easy decision, but uh, I, I do think I probably would recommend radiation. Well, in this case, we we did elect to observe, and you can see that um, she did well initially with serial scans. Two years following surgery, she developed a small nodule on the orbit here that it certainly has imaging characteristics characteristics of recurrent chondrosarcoma. And so we did an endoscopic resection of just that area of tumor. And now with continued follow-up two years later, she remains disease-free. So, you know, put it all together, we've got uh, you know, almost six years of follow-up from the original surgery with only one small focal site of recurrence. 